And there were some studies over the years suggesting the use of immune modulators could be used in chronic CRPS. Steroids have been, were shown to be effective earlier on when there was this sort of you know, very um, inflammatory phenotype in the periphery, IVIG, um, even thalidomide was, has been used in patients with CRPS for its immune modulatory um, potential. Um, but one of my colleagues, Dr. Ian Carroll, had the idea of trying something a little bit different, um, the drug hydroxychloroquine, um, which is an anti-malarial, although it became famous a couple of years ago now with the COVID-19 um, pandemic. But the idea was that hydroxychloroquine um, is used in the treatment of other immune conditions, such as rheumatoid arthritis and lupus, and actually has a pretty reasonable side effect profile. And so in these patients who had very few options, we actually um, decided to treat them off-label with, um, with hydroxychloroquine. And so this is a small um, case series we published um, a couple of years ago now in Pain Reports, where you can see here are patients, again, they're all female just because of the higher um, risk of CRPS in women. Um, they'd all had symptom duration of many, many years. I mean, one of them up to 25 years. So this is really what we would consider to be the more chronic CRPS and refractory. They'd all been treated with many, many different medications and approaches over time. Um, and then they were all put on hydroxychloroquine um, for a varying amount of time. And at the time of the study, our maximum was about three years, but now these patients have continued on it since. And very simply, we just asked them for their average numerical rating scale and then their numerical rating scale after an exacerbation. And there was a significant difference in the groups um, before and after hydroxychloroquine. And so there was at least a signal that something um, was changing and we think it working as an immune modulator. And this is an example of a different patient of mine. You can see here her foot um, pre-treatment where there's a sort of modeling and sort of um, you know, color change here that after treatment um, has really um, receded and she has a, a quite, quite a bit of more definition in the foot. And for her and for several of the patients in, in this cohort, they've actually really felt that the hydroxychloroquine has been helpful. And so this was just one example of clinically, you know, we try these things, there's not a whole lot we can offer these patients, but sometimes in a few patients based on their unique characteristics, we might be able to make a difference. But as a basic scientist, it's a little bit hard because there's not a lot of information about why hydroxychloroquine worked in this case. And so again, I was thinking about, well, how can we, what can we do and how can we look at correlation versus, or causation versus um, correlation? Um, I, this is some examples of where I started to think about this concept of clinically informed basic science. We're really taking what we do in the clinic, the things that we observe in the clinic and trying to do better um, studies in our mouse models in order to optimize the eventual forward translation of these discoveries. And I think we heard already two really nice examples of where we can interface, um, you know, with the clinical data or with um, clinical samples. And this is sort of the, the backwards version of that, where we're sort of, we see these observations of using immune modulators in humans, but we really don't know what they're doing and they're completely nonspecific. So we wanted to understand further the specific immune cells involved in CRPS pathology. And during my training here at Stanford, um, I was lucky enough to um, work in two really great labs, that of um, Gregory Scherer and David Clark. And when I joined um, those labs, I was able to learn how to model CRPS in a rodent, which was really important to me to be able to more um, accurately reflect what my patients were dealing with and understand better the mechanisms involved. So as I mentioned previously, casting is a risk factor for CRPS. And so we use what we call tibial fracture and casting model. Um, this involves closed tibial fracture um, on one of the hind limbs. And um, we then place a small cast for three weeks. And then once the cast comes off, we can start testing behavior. So it's a bit of an onerous um, protocol and it does take a lot of time um, to learn, but it, it actually does replicate um, what we see in patients quite well. And this is here, um, as you can see, and for those who are not used to looking at mouse paws, um, this is an uninjured mouse paw here on the left side of the screen. And then in the injured paw, you can see here that there's some um, redness and clearly the paw is quite swollen. 
and we can take uh, measurements of these different things. So one would be um, allodynia or, or touch sensitivity using small von Frey filaments. And you can see here that prior to casting, the mice responded about 1.6 grams, uh, 1.6 gram filaments. And then at the time of cast removal, this drops down quite low to about 0.1 grams. And then this lasts for a very long time in both males and females, where we see out to about 20 weeks, um, we see that sensitivity. Now, importantly, um, we also see these changes, as I mentioned, that the temperature of the paw is warmer. There's about a one and a half degree Celsius temperature difference. There's swelling of the paw, but the temperature and the, and the edema actually resolve within about four or five weeks. As you can see here, the allodynia or the pain sensitivity lasts for more than 20 weeks. And so we really do consider that there is this transition time where these peripheral signs of um, sort of that inflammatory response seems to abate, but the, the more chronic phase or this um, touch sensitivity as well as thermal sensitivity lasts for a much longer time. We also take measurements that are more functional such as weight bearing. We look at how much weight the mice put on their injured versus their non-injured paw. Um, and that lasts quite a long time where from about eight weeks after injury, they, they still um, favor the uninjured side. So what we're, really thinking about in this model is going at about five weeks, this transition from the more sort of acute or peripheral phase to a chronic or central phase. Um, and the, the more central phase being mainly characterized by this persistent pain, um, as opposed to this sort of peripheral warm, warm, red hot and swollen phase. And in that case, we can actually start to look at what happens in terms of immune mediators or immune modulators during this time frame, during this shift from acute to chronic. So of course we're interested in immune cells and our favorite immune cells um, historically have been the myeloid lineage cells. And so the first thing we wanted to do was really to survey the land and see what these cells were doing overall over time in our model. And it's, been you know, an interesting experience because we're always trying to figure out what can we do with our mice that then we can translate to humans. And it's frankly not obvious how we can do that um, because we really wanna be able to measure myeloid cell activation. And I use that term sort of broadly, although recognizing that activation probably means many different things. Um, but if you want to be able to image myeloid cells in humans without having to take tissue, um, it's very challenging. And so one approach that we were um, lucky enough to um, have an amazing collaborator here at Stanford, Michelle James, she was working on the use of PET ligands um, as an option for really being able to visualize this type of myeloid cell activation. And when we started this project, it was around a time where there was a lot of excitement around um, this um, receptor, the peripheral benzodiazepine receptor, also called TSPO, as a marker of myeloid cell activation. And there were also um, a few studies showing that there was increases in TSPO binding in human models. And so this is just um, one figure from Marco Loggia's study that was published in Brain a few years ago. And he shows here on the top, um, in patients with low back pain, there was increased uptake of this TSPO PET tracer in the thalamus compared to non-pain um, controls. And so this was one sort of suggestion that there was something we could measure and then it would be translationally relevant. Um, and then more recently, there was another paper that came out specifically in patients with CRPS, which was again, nice for, for us, um, showing that there was a higher TSPO um, signal in multiple brain regions. And again, on the right side here, you can see patients with CRPS compared to controls. And this is um, looking at um, binding of TSPO um, PET ligands. And then here's just a quantification where in several areas of the brain, including the caudate, the nucleus accumbens, and the thalamus, um, where they saw increases in tracer uptake. So based on some of these data, we um, wanted to image not just the brain, but actually the entire um, system, immune response. The nice thing about the mouse is that if you put the mouse in the PET scanner, you almost by default get the entire mouse. It's almost hard not to get the entire mouse because it's pretty small. Um, and we developed this protocol where the mice would have um, the fracture and cast um, placed, and then we would scan them at multiple time points after the injury. Um, and I have to say, this was really the incredible work of two um, post back pre uh, graduate school students, um, Haley Cropper and Emily Johnson, who were able to um, repeatedly um, do IV injections of pet tracer in mice, which was definitely not easy. Um, but 
what the what we found with um, with this study was that um, initially we see accumulation of TSPO positive cells around the fracture site, as you would expect. We want these myeloid cells to go to the site of injury, and you can see here in the early days that the cast is still in place. So this is PET scans with CT overlay, so that you can see um, the actual um, structures where we are, and you can see at seven days there's really a big uptake, and this is just quantification of that PET tracer. And then it actually lasts for quite a long time, out to about seven weeks, we see this, um, this increase in, in PET signal at the site of injury. Interestingly, when we looked um, at the rest of the mouse, not just at the fracture site, we saw quite a large increase in TSPO um, signal in the spinal cord, especially in the lumbar spinal cord. And so there definitely was this sort of shift from um, seeing that just peripherally to seeing it now centrally. And that seemed to, um, to peak at about 21 days after injury. And so that was a sign to us that maybe that 21 day or three week time point was actually um, the crux of when that transition occurred from peripheral to central, or at least where central myeloid cells may be involved in, uh, in the transition. We also looked in the brain, um, and I'm sorry, these are not patients, these are my mouse patients. Um, and these are um, different regions of the brain that we quantified here um, and out to um, early on, they end up with high levels of TSPO binding in the cortex hippocampus and throughout the midbrain and thalamus. And then um, at 21 days, we only see that in the pons. So we were interested to look, and this was kind of like an overview of how we could see myeloid cells, both peripherally and centrally over time. But my interest historically has always been in glial cells, having trained with Joyce Saleo at Dartmouth many years ago now. Um, and I really wanted to understand the contribution of these very specific um, CNS myeloid cells um, to the acute to chronic transition. And as um, I think Ted highlighted is that, you know, really wondering if it was sex specific because there has been different data over time from different groups suggesting that microglia um, may have a contribution only in males um, or maybe in both sexes. So microglia are really interesting cells. Um, they're derived from the fetal yolk sac. They do many different things. They're surveillance cells. They're involved in neural plasticity, synaptic pruning, phagocytosis. They do, they do a lot. Um, they migrate to the CNS and then they basically get, um, you know, separated out from the, from the periphery. And um, that's really important when we think about how these cells can self-renew, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but they really have a coordinated network of genes that are regulated with neuronal development. So they're definitely important in, in, um, in CNS homeostasis and in CNS plasticity. I just had, I'd like, I show this video very quickly, but this is, you know, almost 20 years old now, and I still just think it's amazing, but this is um, a laser injury in the brain um, that was, that um, shows microglial cells in green um, going towards uh, blood that has now extravasated into the tissue parenchyma. And you can just see the microglia going in there and picking up the blood. And I just think that how dynamic these cells are is just so impressive. And so we're really interested in understanding the heterogeneity of these cells, how, dy how dynamic they are and what they're actually doing in the case of injury or in the case of transition from acute to chronic. So again, the quiescent microglia have these homeostatic functions and we're interested in looking at how they change over time. And again, knowing full well that it is not just you know, one state to the other, but there is really a gradation of these states. And we think um, actually it's very interesting to know what the heterogeneity is of these phenotypes. So the first thing we did was just to confirm what we found in our PET studies, which was just to look at spinal cord from these mice over time after the CRPS model. And we stained with CD11B, which is just sort of a, a standard marker for microglia. And we could see that over time in both males and females, there was an increase in CD11B um, expression and a change in morphology of the microglial cells that seemed to peak at th three weeks post-injury. 